last week I started looking at the hormonal changes that happen in the body when someone takes an SSRI antidepressant. That was really interesting for me and I wanted to touch on it again this week from a little bit different perspective. Uh, at the end of the presentation I'll work in a paper that kind of goes over a clinical implication of this, which I think is interesting. First, before we can go any farther, I want to talk about the three different kinds of signaling in the body. The first would be autocrine signaling. So autocrine is when a cell releases a molecule, a signaling molecule, and it's having it change something within itself through receptors on its on its surface. So a cell that's doing autocrine signaling would release this molecule here, these blue these blue circles, and it would it would interact here on itself with this receptor and change something within this cell. Paracrine signaling is when a cell releases a molecule locally into the area just around it and affects the cells that are nearby it. And so it's, this is the cell releasing right here, and this is the cell that's being impacted by this paracrine signaling. Endocrine signaling happens between a cell and a distant target, and so this is the cell releasing right here. And the thing about endocrine signaling is that it goes through the bloodstream. And so that's important, and we'll be talking about endocrine signaling for the most of the remainder of this presentation. So the next thing I want to talk about is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis or HPA axis. It's a very hot topic in neuroscience. You'll probably hear it a lot, especially if you talk about mood, if you talk about hormones, um, you know, sex drive, all the things is going to come up right away. It, it's also playing a role in digestion and the immune system. It's really doing quite a bit. And, but it's the interaction, what it is is the interaction between three endocrine, as we just talked about, glands. And so the first one, it starts in the brain, the hypothalamus. So this is the hypothalamus right here in the brain. And then the pituitary gland is the, is the next part. And so this is the pituitary gland. It kind of hangs down below the hypothalamus, but it's directly connected right here. And then the third one are the adrenal glands, which aren't in this picture. They're away from the nervous system. How does this all begin? Well, gonadotropin releasing hormone GNRH is the initial step in the HPA axis. Um, the HPA axis is role. So it's responsible for release of LH, which is luteinizing hormone, and FSH, which is follicle stimulating hormone, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit. But it helps release those in the anterior pituitary, which is right here. Anterior pituitary is part of the pituitary gland. I'll go over that in a little bit. And it's low during childhood, um, the release of this. And it's activated during puberty, so we know it has to do a lot with sex differentiation and a lot of things that have to do with sexuality. The release of gonadotropin releasing hormone is decreased by high prolactin levels. And here it is right here. It's a huge molecule. It's a lot of amino acids tied together. So luteinizing hormone, or LH is what I'm going to shorten it to here, is produced by the gonadotropic cells in the anterior pituitary. And so it's important to look at, this is the anterior pituitary. And that's very separate from the posterior pituitary. Um, anterior meaning front and posterior meaning back. So when you're looking at it in the brain, this would be the anterior pituitary right here. Um, and so this is, luteinizing hormone is regulated by gonadotropin releasing hormone or GNRH. And so when you have GNRH being released, you have more luteinizing hormone being released as well. And so luteinizing hormone acts upon the Leydig cells of the testes. And so what it does there is it increases testosterone production by increasing the expression of the 17 HSD enzyme. And so that does two processes in the sex steroid uh, pathway. And the more of these videos that you start watching, you might start picking up on these as recurring themes. This pathway is very important. But I'll just go over this a little bit again. So you have androstentione being converted um, with 17 beta um, HSD to testosterone. And so when, you, when you're increasing the amount of this enzyme right here, what you're going to see then is, is a higher levels of testosterone building up. And so that's how one of the ways that these, these Leydig cells in the testes increase testosterone when they are activated by luteinizing hormone. So low testosterone promotes GnRH and luteinizing hormone release. And it's obvious that once this is released, then you're going to have the higher luteinizing hormone. But why does low testosterone promote this? It's important to think of it in the cyclic nature that it is. So when you have low testosterone, your body's going to think, I want more testosterone. So what's the way that it's going to do that? Well, through the way that I just talked about, I mean, among other ways, it's not the only way the body works, but among other things, the body's going to say, let's increase the activity of this enzyme. Well, how do we do that? And what the body's done is it has this luteinizing hormone to show you that that should be happening. And so that ties back to the GnRH. So 
low testosterone promotes this GnRH increase. So you wonder after a while, what about the reverse? What about when there's too much testosterone? What happens then? And I'll talk about that in a couple slides. But for now, just, just understand that there is a reverse to this too. So the body's really good at keeping homeostasis or keeping everything in line or in, in, in a certain range. And so it's having these ways to regulate itself and there's many ways it regulates every single option. And sometimes there's more than one way. And so let's think of another way that this could maybe happen. So estradiol, which we talked a little bit about in last week's presentation, and if you haven't seen it yet and you're skipping to this video, I suggest going back and watching it. Um, but estradiol in decreases the amount of LH release. And so what is this possibly from? How do we make sense of this? Well, obviously this is a little bit, um, we're making a little bit of a correlation here, which isn't always the case. You could just have higher estradiol. But remember that estradiol is being formed by the aromatization of testosterone. So if you have a higher level of testosterone, you're going to have inherently a little bit higher level of estradiol. And that's when a lot of times when a man has a testosterone replacement therapy, you'll see estradiol levels raised too. And so they'll often prescribe a testosterone shot alongside of an aromatase inhibitor. Because otherwise, if you increase testosterone really quickly, you're going to get a lot of it being turned into estradiol, which is not what you want if you're a male with low testosterone levels. So that's one of the ways that the body can check and keep itself in homeostasis. So what does this mean? Pulse secretions impacted by sexual stimulation in males. Well, I talked a little bit about how the body is always checking and balancing with itself. So it's always increasing a level and then it says, wait, that's too much, decreasing it back down, that's too little. It's always kind of going up and down around this homeostatic point. So in our example here, this is luteinizing hormone and it's um, being compared to the time. And so what they did in this study here is they took a sexual film and a non-sexual film and they showed them to males as they were live recording their hormonal activity. And this is a very confusing graph. I spent a lot of time looking at this graph and it's still confusing. The point of the graph is just that the amount that this is going up and down, and this is the body, you can see the body regulating itself here. It's going up and down and keeping this kind of homeostatic level of luteinizing hormone. But when you have a sexual stimulation in a male, you're seeing that these are um, increased pulse secretions. And so that's showing you that luteinizing hormone is playing a role in sexual stimulation in males. Over here, I don't talk about much about females in this video, mainly because the case study that I'm going to be looking at later in this video has to do with males specifically. So it's a little bit confusing if I talk about females as well. But know that in females, you have, especially around um, ovulation, you have a very, very dynamic level of all of these hormones. And so that's something that if you are interested in maybe look into more, uh, it goes beyond the scope of this video. But in females, there's also hormone levels and they're changing rapidly and it's incredible. Um, follicle stimulating hormone in, in males it stimulates testicular growth and these Sertoli cells produce the, the produce an antigen binding protein are are where these um, where this FSH is targeting. It induces local testosterone increase in spermogenesis, these Sertoli cells, and they also release inhibit. And so I talked about in the last slide, there has to be something beyond so when luteinizing hormone uses this estradiol increase to decrease the luteinizing hormone release, but what about FSH? What does it use? Well, it these Sertoli cells release inhibin, and so what inhibin does is it's secreted by the Sertoli cells inside of the testes, and you can see it right here. It downregulates FSH and it inhibits its release. And so an androgens stimulate the production of this, and that's because if you have an androgen like testosterone, it's gonna stimulate this to help do a feedback and help keep you in homeostasis. Inhibin therefore also regulates spermogenesis because it's working as part of the the male body where spermogenesis is, is taking place. So here's here's a good diagram of this whole system put together. So here you have the hypothalamus um, releasing GnRH to the anterior pituitary and you have luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone right here in the anterior pituitary. Those So the, the luteinizing hormone is going here and it's activating these Leydig cells and that's using testosterone and estradiol to go back and inhibit this um, GnRH release. And then you have in these Sertoli cells, this follicle stimulating hormone is using inhibin in order to regulate and stop uh, the production of FSH. 
So the study that I really want to look at today, I'm going to totally botch this name, but Safarinajed in 2008, and he looked at sexual dysfunction and SSRI treatment. And so what he did is he split these patients into three groups. So group one had no mental illness history. Group two had an SSRI and no sexual dysfunction. And group three had an SSRI with sexual dysfunction. And that's, that's important to understand these three groups. So what he did is he, he gave him a dose of gonadotropin-releasing hormone analog. So it's, it's mocking gonadotropin-releasing hormone in the, in the body. And he tested hormonal levels at 15 minutes before, um, at the time of giving the GnRHA, and then he gave it at 20, 40, 60, and 120 minutes. And so the hormones that were tested afterwards were luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, testosterone, prolactin, and estradiol. And luteinizing hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, and testosterone were all impacted, but especially these two were the ones that were significant. So look at luteinizing hormone here. So these are normal control patients right here. And so, as you'd expect to see, luteinizing hormone is increasing as a result of there being increased GnRH. And so that GnRH, the GnRH release, or the analog that this is mocking this, is what you'd expect increasing luteinizing hormone levels. But, so then look at patients here that are, are depressed and are antidepressants, but don't have sexual dysfunction. Okay, so significant, significant decrease in luteinizing hormone release. But then if you look at this third group here, depressed patients who are on an antidepressant who are also suffering from sexual dysfunction as a result of that treatment, look at how much more this has decreased than either of these two. But these two are showing you that the SSRI is decreasing luteinizing hormone. And if we go back and look at what we've talked about today, it makes sense that if you're decreasing the ability for the body to create androgens, and, and by doing that through luteinizing hormone, and as you'll see in the next slide, follicle-stimulating hormone, it makes sense that these patients are having sexual problems. So here's follicle-stimulating hormone. You see again, here's the patients with no mental health history. And you can also see that this, this level before they do anything is lower in patients who are on the SSRI antidepressants. But so here's the patients here again that are on the SSRI but are not describing any sexual dysfunction. And then here, the lowest, are the patients who have sexual dysfunction and are on an antidepressant, SSRI antidepressant. So I want to talk about inhibin a little bit. And at this point, this is all speculation. I don't want people to think that this is something that's been proven or that is set in stone. But this is some speculation that I had looking at this paper. Profiling of behavioral changes in hippocampal gene expression in mice chronically treated with SSRI paroxetine, or Paxil, that's the, that's the trade name. They gave mice paroxetine, and they tried to see what was changing in their hippocampus with gene expression. There were only two transcription changes that they noted in this paper that were significant, so much more so than the others. And one of those is inhibin. And we just talked about inhibin a couple slides ago. Right here. So it inhibits FSH release, which is interesting. If you have something that's increasing the thing that blocks the action of these anterior pituitary hormones, maybe this is what's causing their decreased levels, as you see right here. And, and then here it is, so this is inhibin beta A, and this is two point, over 2.5 times increased from mice that didn't have an SSRI treatment. And here's the uh, sources that I used for this video today. Hope you liked the video today. I'm trying to put out about one per week, especially in the summer when I have more time. If you did and you want to catch more videos like this, please subscribe. And if you want to look back at what I did last week, I'll put that video up here as well. Until next time, thanks for watching.